Thank you, ladies. I do appreciate that song tonight. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Isaiah chapter number 60. Isaiah chapter number 60. As you're turning to the book of Isaiah, I want to begin a uh, couple of messages the next few times that I speak discussing the principles of Proverbs. The principles of Proverbs. Let me ask you a question. How much light would you actually like in your life? How much light through the scriptures would you like in your life? How much light from God would you like imparted into you? You know, if, if, if you're just doing a regular task around the house or, you know, something that doesn't require too much light, you know, a small flashlight might work, right? I mean, it's, it works, it's fine. If it's, if it's uh, dark, this would create quite a bit of light. But sometimes in life, you can't trust a little flashlight. You need something with a little bit more power, something that can zoom in and kind of just, even in a, even in a well-lit room, this light is brighter, bright enough to cast a light on the, on the wall. So depending on how strong your flashlight is in your life, how much light you cast makes a difference. And the light that you get is directly related from the Word of God. And I'm, my question is very simple. How much light do you really want in your life? David said an interesting thing in Psalm 51. He said, uh, he, he said wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It's interesting that he didn't, he, 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 David wanted to be washed so that he could be white. He didn't want to be cleaner, he wanted to be clean. There was no degree to which David wanted God's cleanliness in his life. Light is similar to that. David would have wanted as much light as humanly possible that God would impart to him in his life. We need light in our life. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse number 1. Notice what the Bible says. Verse number one, the Bible says, and arise, shine, for thy light is come. This is, a, a, this is pointing forward to the thousand year end of Christ. This is the condition of the earth at that time, but it is incredibly applicable to today. He says, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Watch this. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. I think you would agree with me when I say darkness today covers the earth. But it doesn't stop there. Notice verse 2. The darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness, watch this, the people. Notice that the earth is darkness, but the people are gross darkness. Understand something in this world. This world is full of darkness. You are born into darkness. This world is nothing but darkness. This world system is nothing but darkness. The world religious systems are nothing but darkness. The worldly wisdom that this world has to offer is nothing but darkness. And your heart in its, in its unregenerate state is nothing but darkness. The Bible's very clear. The world is covered in darkness and the people are gross darkness. Turn up to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Understand something. The world being full of darkness is exactly what we see elsewhere in Scripture. The Bible talks about God being the God of heaven and earth, but it also refers to Satan being the God of this world, God the small g of this world. And I want you to see something that Satan does when it comes to the light that we need. Notice what the Bible says about the God of this world, Satan, and what he does to people. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 4, it says, in whom the God of this world, and before we go on, that is Satan, if you don't have uh, the, 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 the two words, the God, circled, put, you should circle that and put Satan next to that. That's Satan. In whom the God of this world, watch this, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Notice what blinding means. It means to bring darkness. And so Satan's expertise is to bring darkness into people's lives. Specifically, look at who he brings darkness to in verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Understand, an unsaved person's mind is blinded by Satan. He is blinded by birth. He is blinded by conception. Think about, I want you to consider the darkness of, of an unsaved person. An unsaved person, they're born into a dark world with an already dark heart. Think about that. Man, you know what they need? They need light. They need the light of the gospel of Christ to shine through the darkness. Notice what the Bible says in verse 4. 
says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, sh who is the image of God, should shine unto them. God wants to shine light down through the darkness. He wants to pierce the darkness of this world. He wants to pierce the darkness of an unsaved heart, and he wants to shine light into that heart. He has to penetrate the world's darkness. He then has to penetrate the heart's darkness to reach that heart that God loves so much. The Bible says in verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. So the preaching of Christ is the light. He says, And ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so God loves us so much, he wants to pierce the darkness of this world. He wants to pierce the darkness of our heart to bring the glorious gospel of Christ into our hearts. Understand something about Satan. Satan is a master at blinding people. I want you to think about this. In Genesis chapter 3, what did he promise Eve? The Bible says in Genesis 3, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be what? Finish it for me. Opened. What did he promise? What did Satan promise Eve? Eve, whose eyes were already opened by God, Satan promised that her eyes would be opened. And the Bible says, after they partook of that sin, then the, the Bible even says, the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked. And so what did Satan do? He promised his sight, but he actually blinds people with the very thing that he's using to offer sight with. That's what he does. Think about how the master of Satan. Satan did that to two people who were, who were directly created by God, who did not even have a sin nature. Satan did that to people who were directly created by God with no sin nature. They had the potential to sin, but they had no sin nature, and there was no darkness in the earth. Sin had not taken captive the earth yet. And so if Satan was able to do that to Adam and Eve, if Satan was able to take something and twist it in such a degree that, that he, Satan, promised Adam and Eve light, but actually caused blindness to them, if he could do that to them in a perfect environment, who do you think you and I are? You and I walk around blind every day to certain things. We walk around blind every day to certain sins in our own lives, certain blind spots in our own lives, certain ways that our pride gets the best of us. If, the, if he did that to Adam and Eve, don't, listen, this isn't one of those things where I say, you better watch out. If he did it to Adam and Eve, he can do it to you. No, no, no. I'm saying he did it to Adam and Eve. He is doing it to you. It's not that he could do it to you. He is doing it to you. Every one of us has areas where we are blind, but we don't know it. If we knew it, we wouldn't be blind. By the way, I wonder if that's what preaching does, and I, I wonder if that's what accountability does. That part of our heart that rears up at authority and that rears up at accountability, I wonder if that is actually God's way of getting us to open our eyes, but we so are, are, are enamored by our sin, enamored with the thought that we're not doing anything wrong, that we hold on and clutch to our sin, and we don't want to have our eyes opened. Satan's a master at this. He basically said to Eve, hey, this fruit will, you, will allow you to see. And the fruit itself was the object that blinded Eve. You see, there's children and teenagers all over here in this room, and you think that your parents are keeping you from something, and you think that if you could just get out from the rule of your parents, then you could see. Understand, your parents are keeping you safe. Your parents are keeping you secure. You get out in the real world under, outside of the protection of your parents, and you give uh, them trouble, and you live and lead a rebellious life, and you leave on rebellious terms, you're completely blind to what's really happening. The thing that Satan uses to convince you that it will cause you to see is that exact thing that actually causes your blindness. Like your anger, it's causing you to be blind. Your bitterness, you think you're seeing clearly in your bitterness. You're actually blinded. Right. Your lust, you name the sin, and that thing is causing you blindness. And if Satan blinds the individual... In the very sight of the thing, in, with the very thing that's, that he's offering sight, understand he does that to us regularly. There are people in this room, I may be one of them, who we at times think that we're seeing clearly, 
but there are some significant blind spots and blind areas of our lives. I asked you again, how much light do you really want in your life? Turn up to 1 John chapter number 1. I want you to see something. 1 John chapter number 1. You see, everybody in here would probably say that right now they are seeing things clearly, seeing things in life, seeing things in their own life clearly. Most people in here would say that they're seeing the situations of this world clearly. Most people in here would say that they're seeing things clearly. But understand something, if you are focused on this world and the world situations and you're not specifically focused on Scripture, then it doesn't matter how clearly you think you're seeing something, you're actually blinded in some capacity. Think about this. Go back to David when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. You go back to King David the day before he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and you ask King David, who was not out with uh, Uriah and Joab fighting battles like he should have been. It was the time that kings went forth to war. You ask David the day before he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and you said, King, are you seeing things clearly right now in your life? Do you know what David would have said? He would have said, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm seeing things clearly. We have the value of hindsight, and we know that he was not seeing things clearly. The point is very simple. You go to a king, a godly king, a man like David. David, are you seeing things clearly? Yeah, I'm seeing things. He absolutely was not. His lust and his laziness was blinding him to some, to some significant things in his life. And so I simply ask you tonight, how much light do you want in your life? The Bible says in 1 John, chapter number 1, <clears throat> verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Understand what verse 6 is saying. Verse 6 is saying to you, if you think that you're right with God, but you are going against some of the basic principles of Scripture... The Bible says in verse 6 that you lie. You are lying to yourself. If you say you're right with God, but you're not right with your spouse, you're lying. If you say that you're right with God, but you're bitter, you're, you're lying. If you say that you're right with God, but you have uncontrolled and unrepentant lust, you're lying. You Name the sin. If you say you have fellowship with God, but you are in an unrepentant state in some way, shape, or form, you are lying to yourself. The Bible says in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with Him, with God, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You're not doing the truth. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, as He is in the light. By the way, who's the light? Verse 7 if it says, if we walk in the light. The light is defined for us in verse 5. Verse 5 says God is the light. So according to verse 7, if we walk in the light, the, the light of God the Father, watch this, verse 7, if we walk in the light of God the Father as He is in the light, the He there, that's Jesus Christ. So follow this. But if we walk in the light, in the light of God the Father, as He, Jesus Christ, is in the light, we, that's we and Jesus, we have fellowship one with another. One, that's us individually, with Christ. So he says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, notice His Son, that's the light, His Son cleanseth us from all sin. And so, are you walking in the light tonight? Understand, if you're not regularly in the Bible, you, you actually can't say that you're walking in the light. You say, I go to church all the time. It doesn't matter. If you personally are not walking daily through the Scriptures that illuminates and lights up your heart, mind, and life. If you're not doing that, it, it doesn't matter how often you go to church. Your personal walk with the Lord, your personal walk with the light is being dimmed and not what it should be. Right. Which means, at best, your light, your wisdom, it is a caricature of what it should be. Right. You guys know what a caricature is? You go to King's Island and you see these little artists and they're, they're drawing you and they look at your facial features. If I was sitting down, they'd, you know, draw me with a massive jawline or a big fat chin or something like that. I remember I was like in eighth grade and, and, and kids were supposed to describe somebody in the classroom, uh, their physical features. And, and two, a kid, two kids behind me said, this person has a big fat upper, uh, lower lip. I was like, man, who's that? 
and, and everyone guessed me. And I was like, oh, that stinks. I didn't know that. But you know what a caricature is? A caricature, you sit down in a chair, and they accentuate the, the features on your face, whether it's your eyes, your forehead, your hair, your lack of hair, your jawline, your, your big fat lower lip, whatever it might be. It's a caricature, which means you look at the caricature and you're like, yeah, I guess that sort of looks like him. You see, if you're not in the light of God's word, you have a caricature of God's wisdom. You don't have the real thing, which means you might be like that blind squirrel who finds a nut from time to time, but don't think for a second you have God's wisdom. Don't think for a second you have God's light. If you're not in his word, you have a caricature of his wisdom. You do not have the real thing. Do you want light in your life? And if so, how much do you really want? Now, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. We'll actually get to the book of Proverbs. I'm not going to go through like a survey on the book of Proverbs tonight. I just want to lay a groundwork for you. Like I said, I want to uh, bring a couple of messages about the book of Proverbs. I don't know how long uh, it will be, at least a couple of messages. Uh, remember, our world is full of darkness. Uh, we didn't discuss it, but our heart is completely full of darkness. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so God is saying, you don't even know the depths of your wicked heart. So we are born into a dark, wicked heart, uh, a dark, wicked world, and we have a dark, wicked heart. We desperately need God's light. And the book of Proverbs is possibly the single most practical book in the entire Bible. The book of Proverbs is not filled with deep theology. I like doctrine. I'm a doctrine guy. I like discussing it. I like debating it. I like learning the different aspects of doctrine. I like that stuff. I like theology. You know, I know the fancy words that, you know, most of us, you know, our eyes would glaze over if we started talking about soteriology and eschatology and what. I like that stuff. Proverbs is not that. Proverbs is filled with practical life knowledge. Proverbs is possibly the most practical book in the entire Bible. The book of Proverbs is filled with wisdom about life. Understand something. The book of Proverbs, if you're taking notes, jot this down. The book of Proverbs teaches you how to be good at life. That's what it teaches you. It teaches you how to be good at life. When people learn and live according to God's wisdom, the book of Proverbs, then they begin swimming upstream in a downstream world. This world by nature just brings you down. It doesn't matter uh, what news you listen to, it causes you to fret. It doesn't matter what website you go to, it causes you uh, anxiety. Listen, this world brings you down. You learn the book of Proverbs, how to be good at life, and you will learn uh, how to swim upstream in a downstream world. Listen, how much light do you really want? When people learn to live according to the book of Proverbs, they will have light in a dark world. Understand something. Uh, this flashlight, hey, teenagers, look up here. Do you know why you listen to your parents? Because your, 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 parents, your parents can see further down the road with their light than you can see. Is this thing on? Yeah, that's on. This is your little light, teenagers. Hey, kids, look up here. This is your light. This is your parents' light. They, your parents, can see further down the road, further down the path than you can, which means you should be listening to them. By the way, adults, when we have difficulties in our lives and we go to somebody for advice, we go to somebody for counsel, if we have a spiritual leader in our life that genuinely knows the Scriptures, that can genuinely help us to apply the Scriptures to our lives, you better listen to them. Their light goes further than our light doesn't mean they're smarter. It doesn't mean they're better. It means they've been gifted in a way to use their flashlight and the flashlight of God's word to help us see further down the path than what we can see. We need that light. So let me ask you a question. How much light do you really want in your life? 
do you really want to be good at this thing called life? Or do you just want to barely get by? Do you want to be good at this thing called life? Or do you want to fail in life? Man, my heart was broken tonight before the service. Somebody came to me and showed me a picture of a young man that used to be in our youth ministry years and years ago. It's a mugshot of him right now sitting in the county jail. Why? He didn't want the light. Thought he could figure it out. Thought he knew better than everyone. And his life is on the path of destruction right now. Why? He didn't want the light. How much light do you want? Most of us are not going to end up in a jail cell. But listen, most of us have the ability to hurt people in our lives if we don't live in accordance to the light of Scripture. And the book of Proverbs is arguably the most practical book regarding day-to-day living in the entire Bible. You don't want to fail in life. You don't want to barely get by in life. Listen, you want to be good at this thing called life. And when I say you want to be good at life, I'm talking about in every area of your life. You want to be good in your relationships. You want to be good in your finances. You want to be good at your work. You want to be good in your ministry. You want to be good in life. You know, one of the things that Peter said about Christ Jesus in the book of Acts chapter number 10, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And then Peter says this, who went about doing good. Jesus was good at life. Anything Jesus did, he did well. He was a master at life. And he gave us a book on the, in the book of Proverbs about how to do life well. Understand something. If you want to be good at life, you must be familiar with the book of Proverbs. Every major area of your life is addressed in the book of Proverbs. Now, I want you to stop and think about that statement for a moment. Every major area of your life is addressed in the book of Proverbs. I didn't say every area of your life is in the book of Proverbs. Every major area of your life is in the book of Proverbs. We would be foolish to not regularly search the book of Proverbs for God's wisdom. We would be foolish to not regularly study the book of Proverbs to see how God wants us to handle a situation. You see, the book of Proverbs is so remarkable because the book of Proverbs is literally a book which contains God's wisdom on any topic discussed. Man has no wisdom inside of himself, none. If you ever hear wisdom, if you ever hear biblical wisdom from a person, male or female, understand all they are doing is repeating God's wisdom. That's all they're doing. In the human heart, we have no ability for true wisdom. And the fact that God would give us a book, care about us enough to give us a book of his wisdom to sinful creatures, that's an amazing thought. That he would even care enough to give us what his will is in major areas of our lives, it's an amazing thought. And so the book of Proverbs is God's will for a happy, productive, and blessed life. Think about this. If you could pull a book off your shelf which contained the very wisdom of God, how often would you read that book? If, if you could go to your, 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 your library, no, nobody has libraries anymore, but if you could go to your library and, 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 and pull a reference guide that's, that's divided in topics from your library shelf that had God's wisdom at your fingertips, what God thinks on a certain topic, how, how often would you go to that reference guide? If, if you could, I'm old enough to remember what encyclopedias are. If you had an encyclopedia on every major issue that you would face, and that encyclopedia was God's will for your life on that topic, how he wants you to handle some area of your life, how often would you visit that encyclopedia? Did you know you have all of these books wrapped up in one? It's called the book of Proverbs. You see, my fear is this, though. My fear is everybody here knows this. And yet every morning you reach for your phone before you reach for the book of Proverbs. You, you reach for the news headlines before you reach for God's headlines. You, you want to find out what's on social media before you find out what's on God's mind. You know that Proverbs is God's wisdom. If you've been in church for six weeks, you know that that book of Proverbs is God's wisdom. And yet every morning, how often do we would be embarrassed if we had people stand this, this evening who regularly go to the book of Proverbs daily for God's wisdom. 
I'm going to give you three things how to think about the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to give you three things to apply. Firstly, how to think about the book of Proverbs. Number one, the book of Proverbs is for time, not eternity. You say, what do I mean by that? The book of Proverbs is for this life. It literally is for this life. I'm not saying it won't be available in the next life. That's not what I'm saying. The Bible is forever settled in heaven, Psalms tells us. And so Proverbs will be there in the next life. But practically speaking, the book of Proverbs is for this life. It is for time. It is not for eternity. Number two, the book of Proverbs is God's will for your life today. Young people all the time, what's God's will for my life? Go to the book of Proverbs. Sit down with me, help me understand where you're going, what direction you're headed, and let's look at the principles found in Proverbs. It is God's will for your life today. The book of Proverbs is, God, is for time, not eternity, and it is God's will for your life today. The book of Proverbs tells you how you should handle your integrity, your marriage, your finances, your children, your sexual purity, your marital faithfulness. All of that is found in the book of Proverbs. It is the, it is the book of God's will for your life today. And number three, the book of Proverbs is God's mind for your life today. Do you ever go through a situation and you just need to know the mind of God? That's the book of Proverbs. So often we get our thinking out of order. So often we try to figure something out, out and hope that God blesses it. No, 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 no. You go to the mind of God, which is the book of Proverbs. Listen, do you really want to know what God thinks about alcohol? He tells us what his thinking is on alcohol in the book of Proverbs. Do you care to look? Or do you still want to drink? He tells us his mind when it comes to spanking children. It's in the book of Proverbs. Do you want to know? Or do you just want to go through life, figuring out life yourself with a caricature of God's wisdom? Well, we'll use timeouts. Okay. Have fun with that. The book of Proverbs is for time, not eternity. The book of Proverbs is God's will for your life today. The book of Proverbs is God's mind for your life today. And three practical applications. Notice first. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 4 and 5, the principles of Proverbs is available to everyone. God's wisdom is not hidden. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 1, verse 4. This is why we have the book of Proverbs, to give subtlety. That means prudence, insight. To give subtlety to the simple. Notice, not to the stupid, to the simple, meaning unlearned. You don't know yet. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Notice that the principles of Proverbs is available to everyone. Notice how much it's available to everyone. Verse 20, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. And so wisdom is about to shout some things publicly. She's uttering these things from the streets. Verse 20, verse 21, (coughs) she crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her voice saying... And in verse 22 is what wisdom is saying. Verse 22, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning. And fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Notice that the principles of Proverbs is available to everyone. Number two, live your life by breaking the principles of Proverbs and you will have a very difficult life. Notice what the Bible says in verse 25. But ye have said it, not all my counsel. This is still wisdom speaking. uh, She is saying, you didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to my counsel. This is the people that break the principles of Proverbs, verse 25. But ye have said it, not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Notice verse 30. They would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore, in the end, verse 31, therefore, these people that rejected counsel, therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. Go ahead and break the principles of Proverbs. You'll be filled with your own way. And you will be forced to eat of the the meal that you have prepared in life. And it will be a bitter meal. 
And so number one, principles of Proverbs is available for everyone. Number two, living your life breaking the principles of Proverbs will lead to a very difficult life. And number three, living your life abiding by the principles of Proverbs causes you to have a very blessed life. The Bible says in verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Notice both are involved, both mom and dad. Notice they're both on the same page. He's saying, listen to what I got to say. He's saying, listen, abide by the principles of Proverbs. Verse, uh, verse 8, my son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. For they, the instructions of your parents, they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Notice the end result of abiding your life by the principles of Proverbs. Verse 33, but whoso hearkeneth unto me, whoso hearkens unto wisdom, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Listen, you live your life abiding by the principles of Proverbs, you will have a blessed life. You will not necessarily have an easy life. You will have a blessed life. The principles of Proverbs is for everyone. It is available to everyone. Have you been gleaning from the light available in the, in, the, in the book of Proverbs? It is God's wisdom. It is God's mind. It is God's will for your life today. You live your life breaking the principles of Proverbs, you're allowed to. You will live a very difficult life. Or you can live your life abiding by the principles of Proverbs, and you will be so blessed. It will be difficult, but it will be so blessed to live that way. So I end with how I began. How much light do you really want in your life. Do you want God's light of Proverbs, of the daily practical wisdom of what God thinks in certain areas of life? Do you want that in your life? Or do you want the caricature? I don't want the caricature. I want the real thing. We'll stand for a moment of invitation.